Hi everyone, a very good evening and uh, once again a very warm welcome on this yet another Edelweiss Classroom Connect Classroom session and uh, the topic that we have chosen today uh, for the benefit of all of us is managing equity investment risk. Now, I'm sure whenever we are investing our hard-earned money and it's more so especially when we are investing in equity and equity-related schemes, uh, there is always that small iota of doubt or degree of doubt that have I made the right choice? Will I make the return? How much return will I get? Although there is a rough estimate that, that somewhere I may be having uh, and I may be hoping that that works out over the period of time. Whenever, whenever we invest specifically in equity or equity-related instruments, I'm always on that tenter hooks in terms of have I made the right choice, isn't it? And that's primarily somewhere because uh, when we invest in equity, we understand that there is an element of risk. And uh, through this session, my 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 submission will be to help you have a better understanding of how can we manage this this investment risk of equity and equity related equity related instruments so that's what i i endeavor to do in the next about 35 40 odd minutes and to to help us achieve this uh what we're going to do is the agenda that we that we'll cover is we'll start with what risk is, then we'll look at some terms like variance, standard deviation, and beta, uh, and we'll then start looking at uh, some uh, some ways of measuring the risk in terms of terms like Sharpe ratio, Trainor ratio, and Jensen's alpha. Uh, so that's going to be my coverage. And uh, without much ado, let's let's first start with this this thing of understanding what risk. Is, right, and when we talk of risk, predominantly risk is defined as any deviation from an expected outcome. Usually, on the downside is when when my 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 risk of investing and you know my my under my 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 entire thing about have I made the right choice or have I made have I invested in the right instrument and chosen the right scheme or or the right uh, security uh, kind of gets enhanced specifically more so when when somewhere in my investment I am seeing a bit of negative returns or negativity from the peak that it had right and uh, and that's 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 when the the risk side or or the risk of that investment somewhere kind of uh, starts getting a little more elevated in my mind right and when we talk of these elements of risk predominantly there are three three elements that 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 become very very important first is the influence of time on risk Right. I mean, whenever I'm investing in my investing for a short duration uh, or for a long duration or in my investment journey, am I close to when I would need the money or am I still far away? Uh, you know, is the first is the first element which becomes very important to understand primarily because if 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 I have time uh you know, uh, for my investments to mature or for my investments to grow, then the probability of me being able to absorb the volatility or that element of risk for most of us uh, to a certain extent will 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 be a little higher right but if i'm closer uh, you know to, to to when i would need the money then in all those probabilities you know i would i would i would be somewhere you know not be, not being very comfortable with that that extra bit of volatility or the risk that my investment is getting subjected to, right? So that's that's the first factor which comes into my mind, and more so. I mean, and and I mean, I mean to top it up, maybe, uh, you know, whenever there is there is an element of risk, and for most of us, whenever we are talking of risk in terms of investment predominantly, for a lot of us. Uh, the first thought that may come to our mind is, can I can I totally avoid it? 
Uh, how would you totally avoid uh, investment risk? You would probably totally avoid investment risk by not invest, investing at all, right? And for most of us, although we may not want to take an elevated degree of risk, it may not really work in our favor if I totally avoid any kind of investment risk because then that would mean that I would be only investing in some risk-free products and uh, you know the risk-free products obviously uh, would be lower yielding in com uh, in comparison to perhaps uh, you know a little riskier products over a period of time and hence can I totally avoid investment risk? Uh, for most of us, maybe not. The next thought which comes whenever you know, we think of risk is can it transfer this risk? So hedging is a is a is a strategy which which is used by a lot of people to transfer uh, the risk loss to majority primarily so that you know if if there is any any ex excess volatility during this period, I am still somewhere hedged. And that hedging will ensure that you know I don't get heavily impacted, uh, you know, by by uh, by the excess volatility. So, so transferring of risk is another thing which a lot of people, which which are, which is, as a strategy is being deployed by a lot of people at least closer to majority. Uh, and uh, you know that's how for a lot of us we try to play on risk when we. Talk of risk predominantly in the investment cycle. There are two types of risks which our investments uh, get exposed to. One is obviously uh, the, the market risk or systematic risk. So whenever I'm investing in any security, uh, you know the security is part of a market, and you know that that is that is what is known as market risk, right? And so if the market falls, there is a probability that my security may also correct. And so, you know, in that in that situation, perhaps I mean it may correct less or it may correct more, but there may there may be a there may be a higher probability of the security correcting if the overall breadth of the markets are also being on a more on the negative bias. So that's the risk which I have. I will my investments will get exposed to whenever I am investing. So that's known as systematic risk or the market risk. Now this is this is the non-diversifiable risk, and the second is the unsystematic risk or a specific risk. So if I invest only in one security and only in one scheme, uh, let's say the markets are doing well, but this security or this scheme is not performing as well, uh, or it's performing negatively. So this is a specific risk to the security or to the scheme. Now, this is a risk which I can manage through this through this uh, term which we keep on talking about called diversification. As we say, don't don't put all your eggs in one basket, uh, right? So you diversify. You don't only invest in one scheme. You invest in multiple schemes. You don't only invest in one security. You invest in multiple securities, primarily so that you are not taking any specific to security or scheme risk. And that's how you, by diversification of your investments, you are being able to manage specific security, specific scheme risks, and you're able to spread it out so that, you know, in the overall, if the market breadth is moving forward with a diversified, even let's say a diversified uh, investment into various equity schemes, there is a probability that you will be moving uh, in the direction of the markets. And if the markets are falling, you will be moving uh, you know, in the directions of, of the markets in, in, in either of the cases. But if you invest in only one scheme and there is a, there is a specific risk or a specific problem with that scheme, then even the markets are moving up, there is a probability that the scheme may not perform as well or may perform uh, negatively. And that's a specific risk. So how do you avoid specific risk? By diversification. Okay, so that's, that's these are the two types of risks which our investments get exposed to. When we talk of risks, it also becomes then important to measuring the risk and in order to help us measure the quantum of risk that our investments are going to get subjected to there are three terms which we will talk about one is variance one is standard deviation and the third one is beta and uh, between these three we'll look at all these three and i'll give you an idea of how these terms can help you in measuring uh 
measuring the risk that your investment will get subjected to uh, in any specific scheme. Let's first start with variance. Variance is a term which is a very, very statistical term. If anyone would have studied statistics in, in college, this is a term uh, which they would have come across. So if I were to just break down, uh, you know, the word variance, it stems, uh, you know, from from the word variation, right? And uh, when you talk of variation, predominantly there is an average and there is a or, or a mean value, and then there are data points spread across this mean value, right? And how much of a degree of variance are you are you having in the scheme is basically what what variance will tell you. So where will you find variance? Variance is available in 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 scheme specific data uh, uh, for 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 all the equity schemes, and and it is it is something which you can look at. So when you're looking at comparable schemes, similar category schemes. So let's say you're talking about large cap schemes, or you're talking about mid cap schemes, or you're talking about small cap schemes, similar schemes. Okay, then uh, clearly, I mean. When you look at the scheme, there will be some average return that the scheme would have delivered and there will be a variance number that is there, uh, right? And very honestly, I mean, if there is a higher degree of variation or variance from that average, then obviously that means that the scheme is a little more riskier. So in terms of comparables, uh, when you're looking at similar schemes, giving similar returns, uh, let's say, uh, the idea should be that a higher variance would mean greater risk or greater dispersion from expected returns and hence greater the risk. So if I have to choose a scheme basis variance, I will choose a scheme with a lower variance primarily because a lower variance will tell me that this scheme is staying that much more closer to its mean or average. So if you're just looking at one data point, which is variance, uh, then I would suggest and in similar comparable schemes, choose a scheme with a lower variance because that means that if the if the if there is an average, this is more closer to the average. Now, I mean, at the cost of repeating myself, uh, you know, let's say there is there is an average return that you're seeing uh, that is there. Let's say over a five year period, ten year period, whatever whatever period that is there, right? Uh, you want to be Closer to that in 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 most uh, years, right? And a variance number gives you gives you an idea of how closer the scheme has performed over 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 a period of time, uh, in comparison to the mean or the average. So clearly, I mean, if it's closer to the average, that means it's less, little lesser volatile in comparison to its peer set. And for similar returns, if I can, if I can get similar returns more consistently or less, uh, or in a less volatile scheme, then I would want to choose that. So that's what variance tells you. From variance, uh, a better term from variance is, is this term called standard deviation. Now, this is something which is a little more common, a uh, little more, a uh, little more spoken about, a little more written about. And standard deviation, basically, just like variance, is telling you what is the deviation of that scheme when you compare it uh, from its from its average or or the mean value or the expected value. Right. Uh, so, so standard deviation, a little more acceptable, a little more widely spoken about. And standard deviation is in the same, uh, you know, same, uh, same term as, as, as the data set. Uh, you know, so in that sense, uh, standard deviation becomes a little more, uh, a little more better, better evaluation when you come, when you're comparing it uh, in, in, in similar schemes. So again, so when you're looking at evaluating schemes, the idea should always be that I have to evaluate similar schemes. So when I, I should not be evaluating and comparing a large cap to a mid cap or a or a, or a large and mid cap or a, or a mid cap to a large and mid cap or a small cap because these are different categories of schemes. The idea of comparisons should be that I am comparing similar schemes, right? So when I'm looking at similar scheme comparisons and I'm looking at uh, 
you know they will all again once again be an average or mean value and uh, then there will be a standard deviation or a deviation uh, which is which is which is basically telling you a deviation of of this scheme from that average or mean then in that sense uh, clearly if it is deviating too much so higher the higher the standard deviation greater the dispersion uh, you know of expected returns and hence greater the risk so again uh, you know i mean i would want to be as close to the average or mean value as much as possible so if i'm looking at two similar two large caps with comparable returns uh, very simply as a no brainer i would i would if you're looking at only standard deviation as a, as a data point to understand the le the, me the measure of risk that you're taking then quite clearly you should take the scheme with a lower standard deviation in your when you're comparing comparing similar schemes okay so standard deviation is something which is which is which is available in fact sheets uh, in our uh, in scheme information documents of most of all equity schemes rather and this is this becomes a very very good data point for somebody to understand the quantum of risk that his investment is taking in comparison to the deviation that it may it may be subjected to uh in comparison to the mean that that is there and uh, hence quite simply in similar schemes i would want to be in a scheme which is less deviating so i would want to choose the lower scheme because uh, the higher scheme clearly is giving me a higher dispersion uh, than my expected returns and hence exposing my investment to a greater degree of risk so that's standard deviation. And the third term that was there in, in measuring our risk was this term called beta. Now, a few, a few minutes back, we spoke about this thing called systematic risk, which is the non-diversifiable risk, right? Which is the market risk. When we talk of beta, beta basically is measuring that systematic risk. So when I'm investing in the markets, I am I am exposing my investment to the market risk, which is the non-diversifiable risk, right? Uh, so, if you talk of markets and you talk of a diversified a diversified index in the market, so let's say a Nifty Fifty or Sensex, uh, the beta of these indices is one. Then there are so this is this is there. Okay, so beta of any any diversified index is one. Then there are scheme-specific beta, which is also published. So when, if I look at a scheme-specific data, now it could either be greater than one, it could be less than one, or it could be equal to one. So, so passive passive uh, funds which are following any index should have would have a beta of one. So they become neutral. So if the market moves, the scheme also moves at the same quantum. So they are known as neutral schemes. So either you would have a less than one beta or a greater than one beta. When you talk of uh, and greater than one beta predominantly then gets capped as a little aggressive schemes. Less than one beta gets get capped as uh, as a little defensive in their strategy when 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 they're looking at uh, you know investments. Now, how do they work? So let's say you're you're looking at schemes, and then there is a scheme which is which is as a beta of greater than one. If the markets are moving up, you expect them to give you you know better than market returns. And when markets fall, uh, the risk side that uh, the risk element that comes up in that in that situation is that these schemes may fall uh, a little more than the market in, as 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 signified by by them being a little more aggressive in terms of taking taking some bets and being a little uh, higher than one in terms of the beta calculation that it has okay similarly if the if the if the, if you if if the beta of a scheme is less than one then in that scheme when the markets move up uh, these will also move up but perhaps a little less than markets but when markets fall uh, they kind of have a cushion that they will not fall as much as as the markets so that's what a defensive strategy would would work which one should you choose uh, that's 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 something which is you know a very very uh, a, a thing where where which beta should you choose becomes on what are my expectations in terms of returns uh, you know but but i mean if i were if you were to just look at a simple simple understanding of what 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 beta works 
Usually a low beta is something which, which people prefer uh, or, or which is said as, as, as being a better, better investment strategy primarily because it is, it is, it is something which is giving you a little absorption, uh, in, in, man, in managing the volatility of the markets. Not to say that that means that you should not invest in high beta. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're looking at better market returns, you're being bullish on the markets. People do invest in high beta, high beta strategies also. So that's something which is, which is something which is, which is also there. So it's, it's a little specific in that sense. But I mean, if you want to just look at one, one understanding, then low beta predominantly it becomes the easier option to choose. It. So that's, that's when you talk about beta. Now, so we did three terms, we did variance, uh, then we did standard deviation in both these terms. We said higher, higher the standard deviation, higher the variance, greater the, uh, you know, dispersion of expected returns and hence greater the risk. So you choose the low one again in beta also. We are saying that a low beta may be a, maybe a more generic strategy, which, which becomes easier to, to manage and deploy. Okay. So that, these are the three terms we did and moving on. He would then look at how do you measure the returns uh, or the risk adjusted returns. And again, we'll do three terms over here. We'll do Sharp, we'll do Trainor, and we'll do Jensen's Alpha. Okay. And these three terms will give you a certain idea of how can you measure the returns or the risk adjusted returns that you are going to make in any scheme. Or, or what is the returns that you would be making in enemy scheme? Now, let's start with sharp ratio first. Sharp ratio is something which, uh, you know, is, is perhaps the most common, most used, and it was developed by this gentleman called, uh, William Sharp. Uh, predominantly what sharp ratio tells us or measures is my reward to variability. Now, when you talk of variability, uh, some moments back, we did a term called standard deviation, right? And, and when you talk of standard deviation, we said is the deviation from the mean. So this is the now, whenever I'm investing, I have two choices. One is I invest in a little risky asset, let's say, like, like equity or equity related instruments, or I may have an option of investing in some risk free assets too, right? Uh, so when you talk of, uh, when you talk of, Let's say a risk free, it could be, let's say, uh, you know, uh, for, for calculation purposes, you normally use, uh, uh, longer tenor G6. Uh, but, you know, I mean, for, 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 and for your understanding, that's, that's so there's a risk free asset. And you are, so whenever I'm investing, there are two choices. One is a risk free asset and one is, let's say, a riskier asset. So riskier asset should obviously, uh, you know, should, should ideally or, you know, if not obviously giving me more, then the risk-free asset, right? Otherwise, why would I want to take any any enhanced degree of risk and not make any additional returns, right? So when I'm so in comparison, what sharp ratio does is when I'm investing, there is going to be a a deviation or variability in terms of the returns that I am going to make. It's not a fixed return that I make, right? And because I am exposing my investment to this variation or deviation, I expect to be rewarded for it, right? So in very simple ways, I mean, if I'm looking at, again, similar comparable schemes, similar in the same category, when I'm looking at comparable schemes, I would look at choosing the scheme with the higher sharp. So, Primarily because what is Sharp doing? It is telling me the reward that I would be getting or should be getting for exposing my investment to the variability of returns. So if it's a reward, I mean, if I were to simply put it, the higher the reward, the better. So quite simply, higher the Sharp, better the scheme. So when you're comparing similar category Scheme. So let's say when you're comparing large cap, a large cap scheme to another large cap scheme to another large cap scheme or a mid cap scheme to another mid cap scheme to another mid cap scheme and sharp ratio becomes your, your data point to, to measure which is the scheme that you want to choose because let's say all three are giving comparable returns. Then quite simply, you go with the scheme with the higher sharp. 
Okay, so that's what sharp ratio sharp ratio helps me in understanding, and this has been one of the prime metric used uh, for a lot by a lot of people, and it is something which is extremely popular, and something which is available in all fact sheets of equity schemes, all scheme related instrument document schemes, uh, you know, uh, all all scheme related documents of equity schemes, and this becomes a a, a good data point. to compare and choose the scheme similar schemes to compare similar schemes and choose the one with the higher sharp okay so that's sharp similarly there is another term called trainor ratio now trainor ratio looks at reward to volatility few moments back we spoke about beta as being your volatility right because a higher beta is a little more volatile lower beta is a little less volatile and over here because again i have a choice of either investing in a risk free product or investing in a volatile product and i am choosing to go with the volatile product i expect to be Ably comp duly compensated for the enhanced volatility that I am exposing my investment to, right? So I'm I'm expecting to be rewarded for the volatility that I'm taking. So so when I'm looking at this again, when I'm I'm comparing similar schemes, the idea should be that because it is a reward to the volatility. Higher the reward, better. So higher the train or ratio, better the scheme. so so you look at comparable schemes and you you, you choose the scheme which is giving you a higher train on okay this is now train on at the cost of reputation helps you decipher the reward to volatility that your scheme is going to get exposed to right uh, and because uh, it is it is going to have a, a degree of volatility i as an investor would want to be ably compensated for the volatility that i am exposing my investment to and in similar schemes uh, in similar category of schemes having comparable returns if i have to choose a scheme i would want to i will go with the scheme with the higher train or ratio so that's the second term so we did sharp we did train on in terms of measuring the risk adjusted performance and the third team is known as jensen's ratio or jensen's alpha now whenever i am investing there will be some kind of an expected return that i would have now this could be basis basis the average performance of a scheme or this could be basis you know some some theoretical understanding of a scheme or security that i have and then clearly there are there will be periods of time when when there would be an outperformance from this expectation right so whenever there is an average there are periods of time when it is over average also right now jensen's ratio or jensen's alpha basically helps me understand this uh, tells me what uh, this excess return in comparison to the theoretical return or the expected return right so clearly because it is it is an outperformance again just like the previous two terms sharp ratio and train or ratio jensen's ratio also uh, if i were to choose i would choose in similar comparable schemes a scheme with a higher jensen's ratio because that means that this scheme has is giving me better outperformance in comparison to the other schemes that i'm comparing it to so because it is giving me better better than average returns or, or it is outperforming the average uh, it helps me uh, you know so over a period of time there was there would be a possibility that the average also moves higher and i would then want to be in a i would then be invested in a better performing scheme so jensen's ratio uh, you know is also known as alpha or fund manager's performance because this is the expected return i am investing i expect let's say better than average return so better than average return means that uh, you know this is an outperformance that the scheme has given which can be attributed or should be attributed to the fund manager responsible for the scheme so it's the alpha which a fund manager generates over over the expected returns and uh, you know 
That's why it's also somewhere in in a lot of discussions known as Jensen's alpha, uh, you know, and this becomes your odd performance because it is odd performance. It, it is giving you better returns. Uh, it becomes a better scheme. So you choose the one with the higher Jensen's ratio. So these were six terms that we did. In the first half, we spoke about how I'm, how I'm going to measure the risk. So we spoke about variance, standard deviation, beta, where we spoke about these lower being the better. And then we spoke about how am I going to measure the risk adjusted returns or performance, where we again spoke of three terms, sharp ratio, preno ratio and Jensen's ratio wherein we are saying because this is this is these are terms which are measuring the return or the risk adjusted return that you are getting and they are they are kind of you know rewarding you for the risk that you're taking uh, that's how you know you are you're reading it so in that sense higher the these terms the better it is but please remember only look at comparable schemes. Similar category schemes are, is something which you need to compare because that's when these will give you a, a better understanding and a better comparison. And these comparisons will then help you evaluate and take better informed decisions in terms of choosing that scheme, which can somewhere help you control some degree of uh, volatility, some degree of uh, you know deviation, and reward you for the volatility and the deviation that you are taking. Okay, so this is what I had. I'll now like to open this for questions, and uh, you know take your queries and questions, uh, you know, so that you know we could respond to them before we can. We can uh, you know, move ahead. Okay, so there's a question is please uh, you know respond to basis market capitalization. So there are three three broad capitalizations that are there: large cap, mid cap, and small cap. Uh, so top hundred companies are known as large cap companies. Hundred and one to two fifty is known as mid cap. Anything beyond two fifty is known as small cap. Uh, so that's how the cap um, the market capitalization is is spread. Okay. Uh, there's a question uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the concept of risk being explained by you is is extremely is ex is is extremely difficult to apply by a common investor. Uh, that is why I'm giving you very, very easy snippets to remember. Uh, so when you're comp when you're looking at comparable schemes and let's say you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, sharp ratio or trainer ratio or Jensen's ratio, you look at the and in comparable schemes, choose the one which is which has a higher or higher value. When you're looking at standard deviation beta, look at the one which has a lower value, you know, I mean, and in comparable schemes, this, this, this simply can become a very very easy way to to segregate and choose the scheme uh, these ratios change uh, there's a question are these ratios static or dynamic uh, these ratios will change and you need to uh, you need to uh, you know keep on looking at them regularly uh, you know uh, and but but they would not change dramatically or drastically on month on month basis unless something something's really gone wrong but there will be a bit of a variation on a month on month basis so there's a question which says i understand the addresses are common investor not mf managers the content must address relevant issues if one has to understand all of this which is possible requires a lot of time and energy investment which is not available with a common investor sir if sir madam whoever has asked this question uh you know you are investing your money a little bit of time in terms of understanding of how and what is the risk that is being associated by with by the investment will will pay long term dividends so putting that little bit of time may only may only be in your favor okay so trainer ratio uh, someone's asked can you please brief trainer ratio in short uh, you know trainer ratio very honestly uh, gives you your let me just open the, your reward to volatility so volatility is something which you get from beta, uh, you know, uh, and when you're talking about investing, there are two options. You either invest in, let's 
say something which is known as a risk-free investment. It could be, let's say, uh, you know, your bank FD if if that's what you think is as risk-free. For calcul for 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 calculation purposes, we usually use a ten-year GSEC uh, as a risk-free rate. Uh, so that is an option which, because it's a government bond, and you know, ten-year is the most most liquid in that sense. So that's what you use. Okay. Uh, so when you're looking at risk-free, and then you're looking at the 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 scheme that you're that you're evaluating or investing into now this scheme is in all probabilities over a period of time going to give you better returns than the risk free and and that's what it should right so in that sense uh, you know how much is the reward that you're going to get for exposing your investment to the volatility is what train on us uh, you know trade volatility is beta which is nothing but systematic risk or market risk uh, so because it is reward uh, quite simply remember that higher the train on better the scheme okay how to check these ratios uh, they are available uh, these ratios are updated and available for all equity related schemes on all mutual fund company websites so there's a question is there an ideal sharp or trainer or jensens there is not uh, an ideal number uh, beta like you're saying uh, there is a one and then there would be a greater than one or less than one that is why if you look at these these numbers in silos or in, or individual schemes they would not tell you anything the only way to understand whether this scheme is performing well or is performing uh, you know better than a scheme is when you compare it with some another similar categorized scheme so in 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 individual uh, individually it may not tell you anything uh so beta for example if it's less than 1 may tell you that it's defensive is greater than 1 it may tell you that it's aggressive but uh again beyond that even beta doesn't tell you anything only when you compare similar category schemes in any of these data points that's when they start giving you a better picture of the risk that you are going to expose your investment to and you know uh the reward that you may be getting for exposing your investment to that risk so there's a question kindly kindly address mf investment risk also uh, we are talking about investing into equity through mutual funds and talking about the risk that is there and how do you measure it how do you how do you manage and mitigate some part of it by understanding these points so uh, you know in that sense it's this this topic is a little more specific to that and i hope i have been able to address that So there's a question. Jensen's ratio and alpha is same or different? So Jensen's ratio is basically outperformance from an expected return, right? So alpha could be uh, outperformance in terms of you know uh, outperformance from market is also something which is known as alpha. So alpha is alpha individually would be would be better than market returns is what alpha is what what. what usually gets associated with alpha jensen's alpha or jensen's ratio is something where you are giving better than expected or the average return or the theoretical return that you are expecting so that's how the difference so let's say uh, my expected or you know the the scheme average returns over a period of time has been 10% okay in 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 the in let's say the period that i'm looking at uh, in the coming one year the market or the broad markets or the the benchmark index gives me 11 and the scheme gives 12 so the jensen's alpha jensen's ratio will be 2% uh, alpha in individual would be 1% that's how you would look at it so do we require to make a choice between sharp ratio or trainer ratio uh, so sharp is something which which become which for a lot of people is first choice but it you could look at both uh you know absolutely fine i mean you don't have to make a choice between sharp and train okay so i guess no further questions uh thank you very much for your time as usual it was a pleasure and something uh you know we look forward to doing and we will connect again with you in the coming month with another very interesting program uh you know to help you make uh you know these investment do simplify investment decisions and your investment journey in mutual funds and till then do take care and and stay safe everyone thank you bye bye mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully